morning we are continuing in uh, Mark's gospel. We're in Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Now last week we, we did just do an overview. Now we're going to begin to look at the different sections and I think we're going to divide it up into, um, oh, just three or four perhaps. We're going to look at those signs that Jesus said would be there that would precede uh, this judgment that he is referring to upon Israel. We'll see the signs of, uh, that the, well, the signs that this judgment has come. We'll see what's going to happen immediately following, and then we're going to look at the warnings that uh, Jesus gave to his disciples to be ready at all times because it was coming a time when they did not realize. Now, we're just going to look at the signs preceding this judgment this morning. We're going to read those in Mark 13, verses 1 through 13. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you not see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver, deliver brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we need to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is addressing his disciples. He is telling them what is going to take place in 70 AD. He is not speaking about the days in which we are living, nor the days which are future to us. And that we saw from a number of things as we looked at Mark 13 in general. First, we saw that Jesus was answering a question that his disciples had for him regarding the destruction of the temple. Notice again in uh, verse 4, when will these things be? That is, when will these stones be torn down with not one left upon another? Uh, these things happened in 70 AD. This is what Jesus is addressing. Secondly, when he answered their question, he told them what it is that they should be looking for. He was saying, he was talking to them. He said, you, what they should do when it comes, finally, and how they should be ready for it. Again, the Lord Jesus was speaking about 70 AD. He even gave them a time frame as to when all these things were going to take place. He says in verse 30, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, whatever it is our Lord Jesus was speaking about, he said that those who were living at that time would not pass away until it all happened. At that point, which was 30 AD, 
they were only 40 years out from 70 AD, which means the majority of that generation would still be living. And let's not forget as well that the parallel passage in Matthew 24 and 25, which deals with precisely the same thing, it was preceded by some very sobering words by our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 23, verses 34 through 37, in which he was telling them that because of their rejection of him, that God was going to hold that generation accountable for all the righteous blood shed on earth. And then he ends chapter 23 by saying that their house was going to be left to them desolate. Now again, our Lord Jesus is not speaking about the times in which we are living, but he is speaking about his judgment upon Israel for all the crimes that they had committed against God, how he had sent his prophets to them again and again and again, and how they beat them and killed them, mistreated them, threw them out of the vineyard, and how finally when he sent his son, they were going to mistreat him and throw him, actually kill him and throw him out of the vineyard. Now this morning we're going to look at the section that deals with the signs that the judgment is near. And again, because this is historical, we're going to look at the fulfillment of these things. As we do, I do want you to remember that these things are future from the perspective that Jesus is speaking from. It's 30 AD. These things take place in 70 AD. But I want you to see the amazing accuracy with which Jesus predicts what's going to happen before 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. He basically points to four different things. False Christs, wars, famines, and earthquakes, persecutions, and the gospel being preached to all the nations. But I also want us to see the, uh, the encouragement that our Lord ends on, giving them a bit of hope. And that is difficult times were coming for them. There were going to be persecutions. Many of them are going to be put to death. But he says the one who endured to the end would be saved. And you can be sure that our Lord Jesus Christ was with his church to help them endure by his grace. So first of all, Jesus said there would be false Christ. We see that in verses 5 and 6. Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. That there would be many who would come prior to the fulfillment of this destruction of the temple that would claim to be the Messiah. And we do need to realize that in the days in which our Lord lived, there was a general expectation among the Jews that Messiah was coming and that when he came, he would deliver the Jewish people from the Roman oppression. In other words, they were expecting a Messiah. A person cropped up and said he was the Messiah. They might listen to him, except for the one, of course, who truly was the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said their deception would be so powerful that there would be many who would follow him or them. And that is, as a matter of fact, what happened just prior to 70 AD. Let me give you a few examples. Justin Martyr, who was one of the early apologists for the Christian faith, in other words, giving a reasoned defense for why people ought to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, writes this, after Christ's ascension into heaven, the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods. Josephus, an early Jewish historian who lived during the fall of Jerusalem, wrote that around the time of that fall, there were many deceivers and impostors who under the pretense of divine inspiration foster revolutionary changes. In other words, there were many who were uh, claiming to be sent from God who were seeking to bring about revolution. There was a man by the name of Thutis, and actually not the one that Gamaliel was speaking about in Acts 5.36, but one who lived during the time of Claudius Caesar, who persuaded a large number of Jews to follow him to the Jordan. When he said that when they arrived, he would command the Jordan to divide so that they could pass safely through. And he successfully deceived many people. However, he and his company were forced to retreat when Cuspius 
Fadis, the uh, governor of, of Judea, cut Thutis's head off and disbanded the rest of the followers. John Gill, in his commentary, writes this. There was another called the Egyptian, mentioned in Acts 21.38, who made an uproar and led 4,000 cutthroats into the wilderness. And this same man persuaded 30,000 men to follow him to Mount Olivet, promising a free passage into the city. But he, being vanquished by Felix, then governor of Judea, fled, and many of his followers were killed and taken. There are actually many more besides these few examples. Uh, Simon Magus, who in Samaria claimed to be a great one of God. Uh, Dosithius, the Samaritan, who claimed to be the Christ. Uh, Menander, who claimed no one could be saved unless they were baptized in his name. And of course, during the siege of Jerusalem, there were many false prophets prophesying about the end of the siege who led many people to their death. So the point is that before 70 AD and during actually the siege at 70 AD, there were many who rose up and claimed to be the Christ and they deceived many, just as our Lord Jesus said would happen. Now secondly, Jesus said there would be wars, famines, and earthquakes, verses seven through eight. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now what Jesus was saying was that there would be war, which means that the the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, would finally come to an end. Uh, Origen, who was an early church father, tells us that there was an abundance of peace that began at the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that that was the peace that was being referred to by the angels, peace on earth, good will toward men. But this was a peace that was brought about by the dominion of Rome. And it extended throughout the whole Roman Empire. You know, once you've conquered the lands um, and there's no more warfare, there's basically peace. And I should mention that the Roman Empire in those days, in the minds of the Jews and in the minds of the Romans, was, in fact, the whole world. Now, this peace that Rome brought didn't actually end until Nero died in 68 AD. Tacitus, a Roman historian who was about 15 years old when uh, Rome attacked Jerusalem, wrote in, that in the years 68 and 69 AD, that this peace was ruptured by the outbreak of the Jewish war and the Roman civil wars in what was come to be called the violent year of four emperors. Again, John Gill writes this regarding that time. Here wars, commenting on this passage, may mean the commotions, insurrections and seditions against the Romans and their governors, and the intestine slaughters committed among them sometime before the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of it. Under Quirinus, the Roman governor, a sedition was raised on the day of the Passover, in which 20,000 perished. After that, in another tumult, 10,000 were destroyed by cutthroats. In Ascalon, 2,000 more. In Ptolemais, 2,000. At Alexandria, 50,000. At Damascus, 10,000. And elsewhere in great numbers. The Jews were also put into great consternation upon hearing the design of the Roman emperor to put up his image in their temple. Now again, Jesus said that there would be wars and rumors of wars. That is not yet the end. These are merely birth pangs. These things took place prior to 70 AD. Jesus said there would be earthquakes and famines as well. And by the way, he also said, at least one of the textual variants in the Greek text, said that there would be plagues as well. Luke tells us of one famine prophesied by Agabus. It took place sometime during the reign of Claudius. So it would be somewhere from 41 to 54. Uh, this may have been the same one that took place in Jerusalem after the death of, of Herod Agrippa I in 44 AD that Josephus writes about in the antiquity of the Jews that took 
many lives. During the reign of Nero, there was a great plague that in a single autumn killed 30,000 people. Tacitus, writing about this plague, or perhaps another one that happened during Nero's reign, said this, a year of shame and of so many evil deeds, heaven also marked by storms and pestilence. Campania was devastated by a hurricane which destroyed everywhere country houses, plantations, and crops, and carried its fury to the neighborhood of Rome, where a terrible plague was sweeping away all classes of human beings without any such derangement of the atmosphere as to be visibly apparent. Yet the houses were filled with lifeless forms and the streets with funerals. Tacitus also writes of a terrible earthquake that took place during the reign of Tiberius from 14 to 37 AD, that is Tiberius' reign. That same year, 12 famous cities of Asia fell by an earthquake in the night so that the destruction was all the more unforeseen and fearful nor were there the means of escape usual in such a disaster by rushing out into the open country, for their people were swallowed up by the yawning earth. Vast mountains, it is said, collapsed. What had been level ground seemed to be raised aloft and fires blazed out amid the ruin. The calamity fell most fatally on the inhabitants of Sardis, and it attracted to them the largest share of sympathy. During the years of Claudius Caesar and Agrippina, his wife, from 49 to 54 AD, Tacitus writes, several prodigies or wonders occurred in that year. Birds of evil omen perched on the capital. Houses were thrown down by frequent shocks of earthquake. And as the panic spread, all the weak were trodden down in the fury and confusion of the crowd. Scanty crops, too, and consequent famine were regarded as a token of calamity. Now again, there were many more things like this recorded. And certainly when Jerusalem was under siege, there was a horrible famine within the city. Jesus said there would be wars, there would be famines, there would be earthquakes. All these things happened prior to 70 AD. And these were the signs that judgment was beginning. Now third, Jesus said there would be persecution. Persecution against the church in verses 9 and 11 through 13. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say. But whatever is given you in that hour, or but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now Jesus says, you know, that they're not going to go win friends and influence people as they bring the gospel to others. That they would be hated by everyone, even by the members of their own household. Now, the book of Acts, of course, is a record of this. As the disciples went out to preach the gospel, they were not welcomed by everyone, but rather hated. Stephen was stoned by the Sanhedrin very early on in Acts chapter 7. Saul, who later became Paul before he was converted, instituted basically a countrywide, actually a nationwide persecution against the Christians. James was put to death by the sword by Herod, and Peter was arrested and would have been executed by Herod if not delivered by the Lord. Paul himself, as he began to preach the gospel everywhere in the Roman Empire, gives us a catalog of all the things he suffered in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, being threatened, being beaten and stoned many times, and it appears he was even killed once, but the Lord raised him up. He stood before governors and kings as others of the disciples. And finally, before Caesar. Now, Jesus told the Jews that he was going to send to them in Matthew chapter 23, prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them they would kill and crucify. Some of them they would scourge in their synagogues and persecute from city to city in order that the guilt 
of all the righteous blood shed on earth would fall upon them. This is exactly what Jesus was warning his disciples was going to take place before 70 AD. He was telling them because they were the ones who were going to have to endure it. But the Lord would be with them and he would strengthen them and he would give them the ability to speak exactly what they needed to say by his Holy Spirit. We have a great example of that in Stephen's uh, speech, as it were, be before his being stoned. So there was, as a matter of fact, a great deal of hatred, persecution, and martyrdom before 70 AD, exactly as our Lord Jesus Christ said would happen. Now, fourthly, this would happen as they sought to evangelize the world. Jesus says in verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Now, again, you do need to realize what this would have meant to the original audience. Jesus is not speaking to us as 21st century Christians in America. He is speaking to his disciples, and they would have understood what he said as the Roman Empire not as the furthest reaches of the earth, which haven't been discovered yet. This is how they understood it. We see some examples of this in uh, the way that Luke wrote, for instance, in uh, his gospel, Luke 2, verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now do you think that Augustus tried to, uh, to engage or, or to enact a census that was going to see how many Aborigines were living in Australia? No, he was talking about the Roman territories. That was the whole world. The Jews in Thessalonica used it exactly the same way when they accused Paul and his companions in Acts 17, verse 6, these men who have upset the world have come here also. Now, did they upset the entire world? No, but they certainly did the Roman Empire. Now, Jesus meant here that the gospel would be preached to all the nations in the Roman Empire, that the Jews would be the first ones to be reached, as we know from the book of Acts, and, of course, because the promises of God were meant for them, but also to the Gentiles when the Jews would reject before he would bring judgment. Now, Paul tells us that this was actually fulfilled before 70 AD. He writes to the Colossians from his Roman imprisonment in 60 AD, giving thanks because the gospel had come to them, and then saying in Colossians 1, 6, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Paul says in 60 AD, the gospel is bearing fruit in all the worlds. Now we know that this was made possible because of the Pax Romana, because of the Roman peace. You could go anywhere in the Roman Empire. You didn't have to worry about warfare. You could take the marvelous Roman roads and the system of transportation and get wherever you wanted to go. The Lord set it all up so the gospel could get out quickly. So basically, the gospel was preached in all the nations before 70 AD. All the nations, the whole world, the Roman Empire. So Jesus said there would be false Christs, there would be wars, famines, and earthquakes, even pestilence, there would be persecution, and the gospel would be preached in the whole world before judgment came. And that's exactly what happened in before actually 70 AD. These were the birth pangs. The judgment was near, but that was not yet the end. Now finally, realizing the difficulty that they were going to have to be faced with, I mean, Jesus is telling his disciples they're gonna to have to live through this. Jesus gives to them what is perhaps a warning and a word of encouragement in verse 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, Jesus here could have been speaking about their physical lives. If you make it safely through all this, you're going to be safe. I don't think that's really what he had in mind. It's more likely he's talking about their souls. With all this about to take place, the temptation to fall away, 
The temptation to compromise, I mean, think about what the author to the Hebrews wrote to the Hebrew or the Jewish believers and the temptation they were facing. That was right about the same time. Probably has in mind exactly what Jesus is referring to here. You have to endure to the end if you're going to be saved. If you go back to the Jewish system, you're going to be destroyed with it. It's only those who hold on to Christ that are going to be saved, the ones that endure to the end. They might be tempted to fall away, so Jesus tells them, if you hold on to the end, you will be saved. And you can be sure that Jesus was going to supply them the grace to do exactly that. Now, again, I said there is a warning here. If you fall away, you're going to be lost. Don't fall away. If you think you're saving your lives by turning away from Christ to avoid all these things, don't do it. Because if you do, you're going to lose your soul. But if you endure through these things, and if you trust me, Jesus says, you will endure through these things, your soul will be saved. You will gain eternal life. And that's really what matters after all, isn't it? I mean, our life is very brief in this world, just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. What really matters is whether or not our souls are safe for eternity. I do think that's what Jesus was referring to. And I think here's a good note for us to end on, because this certainly applies to us. We need to endure as well the persecution we're going to have to face. Now, I've already told you that what we've seen proves that Jesus is the Christ, if we need any more proof of this. He was telling them what was going to happen in the future, and those things actually did take place. Jesus also reminds us by the fulfillment of these things that he does take his word seriously. I mean, think about this. Those who deny the Lord Jesus Christ were in fact denied by him. Jesus warned his disciples that would be exactly what would happen. Israel rejected him, and so he rejected Israel. The Lord does take his word seriously. I, I think we all understand that up here, but somehow it doesn't always work its way out into our lives. If the Lord threatens something, if you happen to fall under the category of what he's threatening, then that judgment's going to fall on you. But on the other hand, if you do what the Lord calls you to do and you trust him and follow him, you can also be sure he's going to take his word seriously to protect you as he promised that he would. But again, remember, that this is an encouragement to us who have to face similar situations a day. Now, we are talking about historic situations here. The Lord did protect all of his disciples, the ones that were actually killed in, in that, um, he did say many of them would be killed, there would be persecutions and hatred and so forth, many of them would be crucified and put to death. That happened, but the Lord delivered them and brought them safely to heaven. Others he brought safely through. The Lord fulfilled his promise to them as they were faithful to hold on to him. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, we don't have to face the same circumstances that they did. We can only imagine what it was like in those days to live as a Christian in the face of Judaism. I think the only thing we can think of today that might be similar is when somebody who is in Islam decides they're going to uh, confess Christ and become a Christian and what they have to face with regard to the ire of Islam. Uh, they want to kill people who do that, and that's exactly what these were facing. We don't have it exactly like they do. But on the other hand, we don't have it necessarily easy. We live in a dark world, a world in which we are called to stand apart and to stand out as lights. We are to be those who are actually uh, heralding the gospel, telling people how they might be saved. Uh, we are the ones who are to be living a life of godliness that is visibly different from those who are in the world. We are not to blend in. We are not to be like them. I mean, Paul does say on one occasion, of course, to become like certain individuals to win them, but he never means to compromise. He never means to sin. What he means is, of course, in those areas where you can to relate to them. 
The Lord calls us to stand out. Now, the Bible says that if we do live like Jesus Christ and if we do stand out in a world that hates him, that we will have to face persecution. Jesus says in John 15, verse 20, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So the fact is, all who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. I've mentioned this before, and we know it's true. If we haven't faced persecution or that much, it's only because we're not shining that much light. The more light we shine, the more we're going to be persecuted. But Jesus says, if you will persevere to the end in the face of this persecution, if you will continue to follow me and stand out, if you will, in fact, shine the light, not only by your words, but by your life, he says you will be saved. Now, remember, there is a cost for blending into the world. If you deny Jesus Christ by your words and actions, Jesus says he will deny you on the day of judgment. But if you will confess him, if you will confess him before men, if you will live like he lived, if you will live a life of holiness and not back down from the world, you will be saved. You do need to realize that Jesus doesn't give you this command and tell you, go out and do this on your own, and if you somehow manage to do this, I'm going to take you into heaven. Our Lord gives to us the promise of his grace, of his help. That if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, he will give you the strength you need to do this. He will give you the love that you need. You know, we're constantly battling within our hearts between the world and Christ. The, the flesh, the lust that's in us, wants the things of the world, wants the fame and the fortune, wants to blend in, doesn't want to have to suffer the persecution. But the grace of Christ within us, the Holy Spirit is telling us what we need to do. We need to love the Lord. We need to stand out because if we don't, we're not only putting our souls in peril, but also the souls of others. You realize that if you name the name of Christ and you live like the world in the face of others, you're giving them an excuse to reject Jesus Christ because they're seeing you're no different than they are. So why, if the Lord's going to accept you, why shouldn't he accept them as well? We have to live differently in the world. But Jesus says he'll give us the strength to do that. He will give us the love that is necessary, the spirit of God. You realize every time we compromise with the world, we lose some of the influence of the spirit. But every time we use the means of grace, every time we're in the Word of God, every time we pray, every time we worship, every time we get together in fellowship, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're being strengthened and filled by the Spirit of God. And when you have the Spirit of God, you will have everything that you could possibly desire in the world. He will bring peace. He will bring contentment. He will bring the love and the zeal you need to do exactly what Jesus calls you to do. Why were these early Christians willing even to be thrown to the lions rather than deny the Lord Jesus Christ? Why didn't they just compromise, say Caesar is Lord, deny Jesus Christ, and then go into a corner somewhere, confess their sins, and live secretly as a Christian? Why didn't they do that? It's because they had the love of Christ in their hearts. And they knew that to stand in the face of the world and to confess him was a much greater blessing, even to die in his place, than it would be to live on in the world without him. The Spirit of God is the only one who can bring the peace, the joy, the contentment that we're really seeking after in life. He's the only one who can fulfill us. And yet every time we seek fulfillment in something else, we actually lose that fulfillment. We lose that contentment because we lose the Spirit of God. Jesus says he will give us his Spirit if we'll only trust him. And the Spirit will enable us to stand in the face of the world and to endure every trial and difficulty we'll have to face and to do it joyfully until we actually arrive in heaven. The one who endures to the end will in fact be saved. But you can only do this if you place your whole hope 
in the Lord. Remember, we're not saving ourselves by our works. We are saved by Christ alone. But we gain the Holy Spirit by obeying the Lord, by using the means of grace, by standing as lights in this world and not compromising. So I would encourage all of us to do this. What we're really seeking after, even what our youth are seeking after, which of course is contentment and fulfillment. They want happiness. They want joy. That's what we all want. But we're only going to find it in one place. And that, that one thing that Jesus Christ came into the world in order to purchase for us by his life and his death is what he gives to us freely and what, of course, we're dependent upon him every day to give us more and more of, and that is the influence of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one who is going to be able to satisfy your soul, and you will only find him in the path that the Lord has marked out for you. So if you want that happiness, that's the path you need to walk on. That path means you're going to have to stand in the face of the world and confess the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? Take, again, the example of the early martyrs. They were willing to do that because it was, much, it was a much greater joy to do that than to deny the Lord and save their lives in this world. May God give us the grace to see that and to seek after that and pursue holiness because that is the only place of true joy and happiness in the world and the only source of strength to be able to stand before the world and do what it is that Christ calls us to do. So may God give us the grace to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a word of prayer, silent prayer, and let's ask God to give us that grace.